So uh, as we jump back into our journey through the book of Ephesians, uh, let me start with a, a, a big theological idea and just, just stay with me here. Uh, the theological idea is this, is that um, God's glory is inextricably connected to our freedom from sin. Now for clarity, God's glory is not dependent on our freedom from sin, because hello, he's God, right? He, he's the creator of the universe. He is sustainer of all things. He is eternally sufficient. He's faithful. Uh, but in a very real way, God's glory is in a, in a nuanced sort of way connected to our freedom from sin. Now, sin, I just mean the thing, the stuff that wants to kill you, the stuff that wants to take your life down to the studs. And freedom from that sin does not come from you and I working really hard or making better decisions or let me pull myself up by my bootstraps or I just need a, you know, a better set of life strategies. The way that we get free from our sin and free from the power of our sin is only through the finished work of Jesus on our behalf and his spirit at work in our life. And so when you and I begin to walk free from our sin, whatever that sin is, it, it shines a, a particular kind of glory back on God and, and confirms that he is as good and kind and generous and perfect and powerful as he says he is, okay? Let, let me say this in a different way because some of you are, are totally glazed over. Let me say it this way. When you and I walk free from our sin, we're not walking free from our sin just so that we can be free. I mean, that is awesome in itself, but the reason we walk free is so that we can shine that glory back on God and, and, it, and that glory is his kindness, his perfection, his generosity, all that he is, his power, and we can shine it in such a way to confirm that not only there is freedom available for me, but there is freedom available to other people. Okay, still, some of you are like, I don't know where you're going with this. Let me say this in reverse. When the giant of addiction or a giant of bitterness or a giant of unforgiveness has his foot on your neck, you do not make God look as good as he really is. But when we walk free from unforgiveness, when we walk free from bitterness, when we walk free from whatever the sin that is entangling your life, when we walk free from that, all of a sudden there is a light and a glory that seems to emanate out of our life back on God and it confirms for other people that the freedom that has been made available to us is now made available to them. A, a few years ago, um, some friends of, our were moving, friends of ours were moving to Tuscaloosa. They, they bought a brand new house. One of the things that they were excited about in the house is it, they had a, um, that the house had a, a wood-burning fireplace and they never had one. They were really excited. Young, young family, two young girls. And so they move in. And uh, day three of the move in, the, the weather had sort of shifted, I think, like around this time of the year. And the dad was like, this is going to be awesome. We're going to have our first wood-burning fireplace fire. And they had it. It was awesome, very romantic. And everything went off without a hitch, right? The next morning, right before church, the dad was like, oh, I'm going to clean up the fireplace. So he takes all the ashes, puts the ashes in one of the moving boxes and puts, puts the box in the garage. He's like, I'll deal with it after church. So they go to church several hours later, they come back and everything's fine still. Some of you are like, I know what's happening. And they, they come back, they take a, an after church nap and uh, several hours, uh, you know, like or a couple hours into the nap, um, the, the box catches fire. And then the, the garage catches fire, and then the cars in the garage catch fire. And then the fire goes up into the attic and it moves to the front of the house and the dining room catches fire. And then the kitchen catches fire. By this time, thankfully, the, the neighbors noticed smoke coming out of the house. And so they run over to the house. They're screaming like crazy people. They're banging on the doors, banging on the windows. And really the grace of God, the, this, these friends of ours, they, they're alive. They were saved, right? Now, my dark heart, I'm hearing that story after it happens. I'm like, what kind of moron? I mean, like, what? Like, how, how, how unaware, how, how asleep do you have to be to not know your house is on fire? So that is a perfect lead-in, by the way, to where we are back in Ephesians 4 today as we talk about anger. And the reason, here's, here's what we know, A anger, most of the time, it is always below the surface. 
It, it's something that, that we're usually not aware of or other people are not aware of. We're asleep at the wheel. I mean, our house is on fire and we're not even really aware that the house is on fire. And, and usually the, the only way we're aware of our anger or the anger of someone else is when it flames up. And then we're like, where did that come from? And where it came from, of course, is these burning embers that were put in a perfect environment for at just at the right time for it to flame up and, and do all the right damage. And, and of course, by the time we've noticed that, that it's flamed up, it's already done all the damage. It's already hurt all the people where the flame comes out of our life and we've, you know, in our anger, we've hurt people or someone else's has flamed up and has hurt us or hurt the people that we care about. And again, I think what we can all agree on today is that we are living in the most angry time in culture. I mean, maybe it's not the most angry, but it's amplified because of social media and, and technology. Um, and, and so because of that, I think most of us, we're able to sort of tamp down the, the, the big flares of anger. We, we sort of keep those under wraps. And most people actually don't even realize that you're very angry. Most people around you that, that you don't really know don't really realize there is, there, there is this sort of boiling that's happening right under the surface of, of your life. And, and here's the thing. Um, we don't realize it until, until it happens, right? I mean, like game day traffic, some Tennessee fan drives in front of you or, or cuts in front of you, and what happens? It flames out, and you let that person have it, and your wife's like, where did that come from? Or somebody disagrees with your political stance and you let them have it. Or somebody disagrees with you on a, you know, a work project or minimizes your opinion and you let them have it. And we're like, where did that come from? And where it came from is there has been a slow boil your entire life. And, and here's why I tell you this. Is that I, I really, I think God's intention today as we look at just a couple of verses in Ephesians. God's intention today isn't just to deal with your anger. That would be the easy part. God's intention is to actually get below the surface and, and to get to those, those, those ashes that look cold, but they have just enough heat to do the kind of damage that will ruin your life. And so I think God's intention today is to take the cold water of the Spirit and pour it on those ashes. And for some of you, I think this is actually going to be really refreshing for you. And I think for others of you, it's actually going to be very painful for you. But the goal is the same. God actually wants to give you a kind of freedom today, and he wants that freedom to join with his glory. Meaning, he wants you to be set free from your anger today so that... God might show other people that they can be set free from their anger. Okay, so here's where we are. We're back in Ephesians chapter 4. If you're new to Hub City, we've been in this journey through Ephesians. I think this is week 25. And uh, this is just the, the, the low and slow. I mean, I, I learned that phrase this week. This is, this is like anybody make a brisket this week for the game. I think that's what you do. You just stick it in the oven at... I don't know what it is, 200 degrees. I, I'm acting like I know. I think I've ever cooked. You just, you stick it in there. You put some seasoning. You let it just get soft and mushy. And then that's how you know it's good. This is, this is what we're doing in the scriptures. We're just coming, believing that every word, even just a few words, just a, a verse or two has the potential to absolutely change the direction and the intensity of our life. And that's where we are today. We finished last week in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. We're picking up today in Ephesians 4, verse 25. Here's what he says. He says, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. So let me stop there because uh, there, is a, there is a kind of anger that God can get on board for. There's a kind of anger that God's like, yeah, that, that is an appropriate kind of anger. But here, here's what's so ironic about this. That kind of anger, ironically, is not going to look like you being very angry. It's actually going to look like you praying for people that hurt you. 
and blessing those that curse you and doing good to those who do not do good to you. And you're like, well, that does not sound a lot like me getting angry. I know it's a lot like praying for people that hurt you and blessing those that curse you and doing good to like buying them a cappuccino. And you're like, this is not like I'm angry. It sounds like he's my boy. Right? And yet God's like, the anger that is, that is in the scripture, the anger that is righteous, the anger that's actually holy, that he can get on board for, he's like, it's the kind of anger that turns the affection of your heart towards the person. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to bless them. I'm going to do good to them. God's like, I can get on board for that kind of anger. There is an anger, though, that God is not going to get on board for. And it's the kind of anger that he's talking about here. It's the kind of anger that actually opens up a door. It, it creates a foothold. It gives a distinctive advantage to the enemy of your soul. Here's what he says. He says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. So let, let me just stop here again and just say, here's what we know about our enemy. And I, I, we don't like to spend a lot of time talking about the enemy. And the reason is because our 75 minutes together is about lifting up the Savior. Uh, 75 minutes of celebrating and savoring the most treasured person in the universe. But there's got to be a moment where we just talk, give a, a little bit of a wink to the enemy. And so here's the thing with the enemy is he is... Uh, like a lion seeking someone to devour. He is the father of lies, which simply means that he is really, really good at lying and he's really good at getting you and I to believe those lies. So how this plays out is when we let anger sort of settle in, right? When, when those simmering coals are below the surface of our life, and, and you know that is when, when, when you realize you're just like an angry person. Like you're on edge all the time. And if you don't know if that's you, just ask the people you live with. Ask your children. Ask the people that you work with. They'll tell you, I would hope, that you're an angry or you're not an angry person. And so once we let anger sort of settle into our soul, here's often, not always, but here's how often it plays out. What, how it plays out is we become experts in everybody else's weaknesses. And we become blind to their strengths. That's what, that's what anger looks like for us in a respectable society. Meaning we take all of our strengths, we lay them right next to their weaknesses, and that is justification for us to be angry with them. Because we're like, look how awesome I am, and look what the gigantic moron that they are. So clearly I have justification, I have lots of reasons to be angry with them. But it's in that moment that you know you've swallowed hook, line, and sinker, the lie. Let me say it this way. When you and I have an interaction with the, with the enemy, we usually don't know it, right? I mean, it's not like the devil is walking around in a red rubber suit with a pitchfork going, hi, I'm the devil. I, you know, I'm the, the, the prince of darkness. Great to meet you. Like he's not handing business cards out. The way that you're going to know you're having an interaction with the enemy of your soul is often he is going to parade a thought in your mind and that thought in, in, in your right mind, you're going to know that that thought is so contrary to the values of the kingdom of God. But in that moment, when you believe the lie, even though it's contrary to the kingdom, it's going to feel right. It's almost going to feel virtuous. You're going to feel right and virtuous in your anger. Let me show you what I mean by this. Go to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. Begin with verse 13. Let me show you how, how the enemy does this. He says, by his good conduct, let him show, he's talking about, talking about us, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Okay, I, I do love that phrase, meekness of wisdom. Um, and the, the reason is any kind of earthly wisdom that seeks to exalt you is a wisdom you should stay away from. So he's like, pursue a meekness of wisdom. So meekness, I've heard, I've heard it said this way, meekness is not weakness. I mean, there is a, a gospel weakness attached to it, but meekness is not weakness. M meekness would be considered like a yielded strength. So the, the picture that I really like is uh, a yielded strength would be when, if you've ever seen a stallion 
and that stallion has the strength to jump over the highest fence, when that stallion gets a master, it can still jump over the highest fence, but now it only does it under the command of its master. It's a yielded strength. It's a meekness, right? And so he says that the meekness of wisdom is at work. He says, and if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, he's like, don't, don't boast and be false to the truth. He says, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So I'll go back to verse 14. This is where we're going to live for a minute. He says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Okay, what is he saying? He's saying that, that bitterness, selfish ambition, uh, offense, anger, it, all of that is going to have the appearance of wisdom. It's all going to look really wise. I mean, I mean, this is why so many Christians feel justified in being really angry and being really offended all the time. Like, seriously, how many of you guys have ever met a Christian? If it's you, or if, you if it's your spouse, don't look at them. But if it's like, how many of you have ever met a Christian that they're like really angry, they're really offended all the time, and they have lots of really good reasons for it. And they're, they're happy to tell you about it. They're like, this person hurt me. This person wronged me. I was betrayed here. This person disagreed with me. And they're so angry. And they, they feel totally justified, totally virtuous in their anger. And, and yet, and if you know anybody like that, they're, they're usually like the most miserable people on the planet. And the reason is that even though we might have all the right reasons and feel justified to be angry, the, the anger that, that, that God's not getting on board for, it's just poison for us. The angrier we get, the more justified we get, the, the, the more we die on the inside. Let me tell you how this works for me. Um, and and I, I'm, only, I'm just going to kind of sort of come clean to you. Some of you that I'm in community with, you know this. I, so for years, I've had like a, a terrible anger problem. And, uh, you know, it's a challenge because like I, I, I have a, a very public vocation. And so the challenge is like, I, like so many, all of us are having to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. But unfortunately, in my role, I, I often have to do that in public. I have to work out my salvation in public, which is a terrible, painful thing to do. And so for, for years and years, like my anger... It, it does not serve me well. And so for, I don't know, the last five or six years, I, I, I realize it's, it's hurt the people I care about most. It's hurt the people that I work with. And so I'm just like, okay, Lord, what, how do you want to deal with this anger? How do you want to, you know, how do you, how do you want to address this? And so one of the ways that, that God has done this for me is, and it's, it, this is, it's very painful, and, but it's super weird. Um, is in the quiet moments of my life, which is usually the shower and my car, because I don't, I don't play anything in my car, um, that's usually when God will bring up memories. He'll bring up people that, that have hurt me. Um, so, I don't know, a few months ago, he brings up uh, a scenario from the 10th grade and a guy named John Stennett, and I don't think, hopefully John Stennett's not watching. John, uh, John Stennett, like straight up punched me out. That's not funny, okay? <laughs> so you're like, that hurt, that hurt my feelings, okay? Uh, like straight up beat me up in front of my best friend in the mall. Um, you guys are the worst encouragers. Okay. Um, and so, you know, I, I, and then I became a Christian and uh, and every time I think about John, like there would be the shame and anger and, you know, early in my Christian experience, like I learned, okay, I, I got to walk in forgiveness. Like forgiveness is a trap. Unforgiveness is a trap. And so I just got to walk in forgiveness. And so I was taught, like, you just like say it, like I forgive this person. I'm going to choose to forgive. It's an act of the will, which is true. 
Um, but every time John would come up in my mind, I, I just, I wanted bad things to happen to John. Like, I, you know, that's how you know. Like, if, if you're like, I've forgiven them, and then you see them in Walmart, and you go the other way down aisle 18, like, that's how you know forgiveness hasn't taken hold. And so that, that's, so God's bringing up John Stennett to me, and I'm like, oh, man, like, it's still, it's still there. And then literally two weeks ago, I'm in the car. God brings up this pastor, like, 10 years ago, this pastor in our city, uh, and he was saying like, l- like lies about me, and it was very painful. And um, and you back me in the corner, like I don't like confrontation, but I will. And so I saw this guy at Sokol Park, and I walked out right on the softball field, and I confronted him. Did not go well, as you'd imagine, right? <laughs> um, and and God brings that, and God brings this guy up to me, and and then um, regularly God will bring up people that the the thousand people that I've hurt doing what I do, and then often the, the handful of people that have responded poorly back to me. And so God brings these people up, and, and, and a couple of things that he, he just regularly says, he's like, John, you have no right to the offense. And the reason, and this is a theological reality, and the reason is that when Jesus went to the cross, Jesus didn't just take our sin and our shame, but he took the offense of, this, of sin. And the reason, this, this is maybe new information for you, but when we sin against one another, we're not sinning firstly against each other, we're sinning against God. The offense lies squarely on God. And so if there's anybody in the universe that has the right to be offended by you and I, it would be the God of the universe. And yet what God does in his grace towards us is he takes this truckload of offense, this universe-sized truckload of offense that we deserve back on us. And what he does is he lays that offense on his son, Jesus. And so when someone sins against me, and and unfortunately when I sin against someone else, that offense is not something that I'm even allowed to take up because that offense has been put on the Son, Jesus. And so the, the backside of this is not only do I not have the right to be offended because Jesus has taken, taken it, but I don't have the right to be offended because, because to, to live an offendable life is to live a life that is, is opposite to the abundant life. I mean, this promise that, that Jesus gives us on John 10, 10, where he, he contrasts it with the enemy. He's like, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come to give you life and give it to you abundantly. He, he, he makes that contrast on purpose because when you and I live in anger, when we live in offense, when we live in, in this constant state of other people are our enemy, Jesus says, that is the enemy of abundance. That's the enemy of a life of flourishing. And so I, I just, I'm learning to live a life that says, I'm, I'm just not going to be offended. I, I, I can't afford to live a life of offense. And, and I tell you that because, and I'm not saying I'm nailing that. I, just please hear me. Like, because if, if you're in community with me, like, you know better. Because you're like, yeah, he's not, he's not, that's a D minus. Okay, he's not failing, but it's, he's not passing either. Okay, but I, I bring this up because... God's design and God's pleasure over our house today is that he wants to set you free from offense today. I mean, some of you, and again, even in your mind, you're you're bringing up all the reasons why you have a right to be offended. You're bringing up all the the ways that people have hurt you, have let you down, have betrayed you, have absolutely done the worst things to you, and there is a a validation in your anger and your offense, and, and, and you're not wrong. But you, you don't have to carry the right to be offended. You, you, get to, you get to lay that down today. And so what I want to do, I, I, there, there is no like, do these three things and you'll be free from offense. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And that's why at the very beginning of the talk, I said, for some of you, this is going to be a cup of cold water. And then others of you, it's going to be very painful. And the reason is here, here's, here's the order. When we let anger settle, it turns into bitterness. And when we let bitterness settle, it turns into a bitter root. 
And when that root of bitterness goes down deep and you have to pull up that root, I don't know if you've ever done gardening, you pull up that root, it does collateral damage to healthy things. And so today God's gonna pull up a bitter root for some of you and and it's gonna be very painful for you, but it's gonna bring life to you. And so here's what I wanna do. I wanna, um, we're almost out of time. I want you to stand with me. And I'm just gonna invite the presence of the Holy Spirit to minister to you. And, and it, it may, something may happen for you right now. It may be on your way home. That's often how it happens for me. And Will's just gonna play quietly. We're not gonna sing a song. I, I, we just, I wanna invite the presence of the Spirit, the Spirit of God to, to, to work on your behalf. He loves you so much today that it wasn't just some, it wasn't just that Jesus came to die on the sin, to die on a cross for you for your sins. He said, I'm gonna give you my spirit to abide with you. And so, I, you know, maybe get yourself in a posture of, of receiving, maybe put your hands out or you can kneel. Because here's the thing, every one of us, we, we've got something that we're holding on to. We've got a place of anger, a place of offense against uh, your father or your mother or a sibling. Some of you, just even a sense, some of you have an offense towards God today. And you're like, God didn't do what I thought he was supposed to do. And he, even now, the spirit of God is just going to give you a revelation of how good God is to you that he is a perfect father to you. So Holy Spirit, we we ask you to, to now minister to your people. Only you can set us free from from the anger that destroys us. You're the only one that can set us free from offense. So now just do do a deeper work in us.